Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Nintendo Fuse's Industry Talk. I'm your host, Barry, and I am joined today by my colleague, Greg. Hi, everyone. And our special guest for this episode is Kevin Simmons and Zach Johnson of Asymmetric Publications. Howdy, everybody. Hi, I'm Zach. And if you haven't heard of Asymmetric Publications, you really should. They just put out a game called West of Loathing. Uh, this is available on the Switch. It's also available on Steam, Mac. Uh, it's only eleven dollars, and uh, well worth well worth your money. Uh, now let's start with uh, let's start with the company Asymmetric. Uh, Zach, you you were the founder of the company. Why don't you tell us how this came to be? So in 2003, I started working sort of nights and weekends on this kind of goofy project uh, to make a, a sort of a web-based, uh, turn-based MMORPG uh, with sort of silly stick figure graphics and, and a lot of jokey writing. Uh, and uh, I worked on it for a week and then put it out in front of people. Uh, it was called The Kingdom of Loading. And uh, it against all odds it sort of immediately took off and found an audience and started making money and i then over the next couple of years sort of built up uh, the company around me found some people to help me sort of add content to it and maintain it and deal with business stuff and that's uh, that's where kevin came into the picture what like a year and a half in maybe two years. um and then um like maybe three years ago we decided it was time to make another project in the loathing universe and we decided to actually hire a real programmer and a real animator and make a make a more real video game as opposed to just a, kind of an illustrated web page. And that's where West of Loathing came from. Now, this is this is a very unique take um, because it is stick figure. And, you know, this was actually shown off in the uh, Nindies. They showed this off. And, you know, how did, how did that help you uh, being in an indie showcase? Well, it's hard to say. Uh, this is our first experience with any console at all. So, uh, you know, I, we, we constantly find ourselves wanting to be able to like A, B test the universe to see what would have happened <laughs> if we had done something slightly differently. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it, it was very exciting to us. I think we're, we're all a bunch of like 40 year old dudes. So we grew up with Nintendo and to have, to have made a game and then had Nintendo approach us and ask us to bring our game to their platform was really exciting and, and really flattering. Um, you know, it's been, it's been great. The, the game is doing great on the Switch and I think it's partly because it's a really good fit for the Switch, both sort of tonally and gameplay-wise, and also undoubtedly in some part due to the support and promotion that Nintendo has given us. So you said Nintendo approached you. That's cool. How how has it been working with Nintendo in that department? Uh, you'll have to ask Kevin. I I, I just sort of rested on my phone <laughs> as well. Other people did all the work. Uh, in general, it's been great. Uh, they've they've been very supportive. Um, it. We are a very sort of casual. Uh, I get we've been, we've been insulted as and called like a lifestyle company uh, because we're not interested in you know making a bajillion dollars or whatever. We're very happy in the sort of very small uh, sort of market share that we have in terms of audience or whatever. Um, and so working with a company that has just a tremendous amount of sort of bureaucracy and corporate overhead and stuff like that has definitely been a, a huge change. There are. Um, Tons of forms to fill out, and uh, like when you develop on the the switch, there are like thirteen different websites you have to log into for different things uh, at various times, um, and so that's just like a sort of a different kind of model because we're we're just a handful of of folks working on a video game, and there are you know thousands of people doing that sort of infrastructure stuff. Um, but they've been super supportive. Uh, the only sort of issues that we had were just like working to a deadline, right? Like, they wanted to know when we would get the game out, and we are like, uh, late May? Sure. <laughs> and then um, they were very nice and not, like, forcing us to announce a date until we were really sure that it was going to be ready. Uh, but, like, trying to actually get through uh, certification is always a, is a, always a hassle, um, and that's not unique to uh, Nintendo. That's, you know, any, any console is going to be the same way in that regard. This, and this wasn't hard, but it was weird. We had never had to get like an ESRB rating before. Mm -hmm. And so that was just, it, it turned out to be because of whatever that, I forget the name of the, the program that like, so, is it Sony? Uh, there's, a, there's a program that uh, a bunch of digital shops have sort of worked together to, to make. Uh, it's the Nintendo eShop, Microsoft's 
I don't know if it's Xbox or just the Microsoft Store, uh, Android, and maybe one or two others um, for, got a sort of coalition together called iARC. Um, and you can just fill in a sort basically a web survey um, that it answers a bunch of questions about like what the content of your game is like, and then they'll just give you a uh, a bunch of different ratings that you can use only on very specific sites. So like we um, we got an ESRB rating for the eShop and uh, Peggy rating and stuff like that. Um, there's a couple of weird exceptions. Like we don't have a um, an official rating for New Zealand, and because our game uh, is rated sort of is a restricted game, which means like a teenager or, or above um, in Australia, we can't just use the Australian rating in New Zealand. And so we can't sell the game in New Zealand currently on the eShop, um, which is a disappointment. Um, and we'll have to, we're gonna have to actually pay the um, kind of high, I feel like, uh, rate to get them to like officially review it, to get it out on, in um, New Zealand. And so that's just a whole process that we have to go through. Um, that's unfortunate. Um, yeah. but, you know, I, I know there's something going on with the ESRB, and you know, a lot of a lot of companies like Limited Run Games uh, were putting out titles without it, and now they suddenly have to do it. Uh, I don't know if they're cracking down, but uh, I, I know it's a hassle to try to get. Like, they right actually, now. I mean, we've so we're actually in. Um, we've we're we have a agreed with Limited Run Games to put out a, a visible version of uh, West of Loathing. Oh, um, fantastic. That yeah. was going to be one of my questions. <laughs> yeah. They'll be doing, a, I think, an order in, in early August. Um, but as part of that, we're going to have to get an ES, like a real ESRB rating. Um, and they said that they've done it like 70 times before. So I don't know, how, I don't know when that kicked in. Um, but they've, they've definitely done it a bunch of times. And they're going to be helping us go through that process. Because it is kind of a hassle, I think. Um, to actually, to actually complete that thing, it's I've I've talked to other people who worked in AAA and who actually did the paperwork for it, and they have to provide all kinds of video documentation that you have to basically show them the worst parts of your game, um, and then explain in detail uh, with paragraphs of text like what the thing. And like our game is so silly that it's like I'm curious what our what our human moderated ESRB rating is going to be compared to the one just from the web survey because it's all of the stuff we we like technically hit a bunch of bullet points, but it's just, our game is so goofy that it seems silly that our game is, is actually rated T for teen. Like, I, you know, I think most parents would probably be okay with like an 11 year old playing our game. The, the only real thing that we do a lot of is like glorified booze, but that's because alcohol's awesome. <laughs> well, it's I mean, it does fit the setting as well too. I mean, it's, yeah, it's wild west. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd say I'd say probably the worst part of the game in terms of that, uh, not not that it's bad, just in terms of like higher maturity, would probably be the Spatoon scenes. And those are those are you know it's funny because I was telling a friend of mine about this game, and I was like, oh, you've got to play this game. So like, I'd never heard of it, and I was like, well, I don't want to spoil it, but I'm just gonna let you know about this one thing. And I started talking about the Spatoon, and they're like, oh, I know about this game. Like apparently that <laughs> has, has made its rounds. Like, oh, it's the Splatoon game. You know, like you have to play it because of that. And I was showing my wife when I was playing, and she's like, "What are you showing me? Like, this is disgusting." And I'm like, "No, this is great. Like, <laughs> this is so great." So that would probably be the worst thing for your rating. Uh, I guess it's, but it's like a text. It's a textual experience, right? It, it, it's only bad because your imagination is so good. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah, I love the humor. Uh, did you both do the writing and the humor? Did you have someone else come in and do the writing? Because it's it's a very funny game. So the writing was about twenty percent me and eighty uh, percent Riff, the other writer, who he's been working with us on Kingdom of Loathing for fourteen, thirteen, fourteen years at this point. We came on about the same time. Yeah, we uh, we we have spent so long just sort of developing this kind of house style, and and it's uh, it's just kind of very easy for us to work together, and it's it's very easy for us to produce a lot of this kind of content in a hurry. Um, so we really sort of designed this game to to play to our strengths and just let us cram as many jokes in as we could without having to think about it too much. Yeah, students were all riff though. That's uh, I can't uh, I can't take credit for and the stuff that people notice in reviews. It's never the stuff that I wrote. So I, I he's he's really carrying me. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, not only the humor though, I was surprised at just how deep this was because at first, uh, you know, I got the I I only saw the Nindies thing. I didn't know what it was getting into, and I was like, all right, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna give this game a try, and and I started playing it. And I'm like, oh, this is gonna be like a lighthearted thing. And then I realized how deep it was, like the very like D and D style mechanics. You know, like uh, one of the early things was, you know, you're going to the the there's the bandits, and like one of them's in the tub, and you know, 
you know, I, I just drowned them in the tub and it's like, you're ruthless now. And uh, now you're the ruthless tree and you can do ruthless. Lava. I'm like, Oh, that's really neat. And then like, before I left loathing, it was like, Oh, where's the soap? I want to give the soap. And I found out, Oh, the soap w- would have been given to you by the guy in the tub. Had I not just killed him. I'm like, Oh wow. That's so, so cool that there's different paths that you can take. Uh, and that's when I knew, cause it was, that was really early. I'm like, all right, I'm in for a really good experience here that, that warrants multiple playthroughs. That's yeah, we were able to yeah. make the prologue pretty good. As a result of we we showed the game at so many conventions, and we just saw hundreds of people playing through the opening parts. Like that, that like that prologue was sort of secretly the tutorial was kind of how we always thought of it, and we wanted to sort of introduce the systems and introduce what the game was like. And we were, we were just able to get so much more playtesting feedback on that because it was also the demo at shows that we just, anytime we saw somebody try something or be disappointed that something didn't work, we could just, oh, let's make that do something. Or, you know, somebody walked up to something and it didn't give them a joke. Oh, let's put a joke there. Yeah, it was, it was, I didn't even realize it was going to be like the demo part, but there's so many choices you can make between the horses, whether you want to go get the horses or just keep the default, which partners you want the default partner, you want to go get one of the others. Uh, and, and I thought that was really, really well done. In fact, uh, I was talking with Greg, uh, cause we, we were going to be doing a game chat, uh, review for West of Loathing and we're going to put these out around the same time. And, uh, it was interesting because we picked different horses and we picked different partners, but we both were upset that we couldn't take a second partner. Cause I went through and I, I was able to recruit all the partners. I'm like, Oh, this is going to be great. I got a whole band. It's like, which one do you want to take? I'm like, what do you mean? Which one? I want to take them all. <laughs> yeah. I had same sh- shared that same set of thoughts. Like I unlocked, spent the time to unlock all of them and I only can take one. That's like, <laughs> well, they, they say unlock. If, if you start another character, you can skip the tutorial and anybody that you unlocked is available as an option to you when you skip it. So okay. they, we, um, <clears throat> we, we sort of initially, my idea of what this game was going to be was way more of a like short replayable playthrough of, of the, the same sort of core game. Um, and so the, the main quest was pretty flexible, pretty, pretty short, pretty limited. And there was a lot of optional side stuff. And the idea was that more of that stuff would be, get, like there would be big chunks of the game that you could only get to with a specific horse or with a specific partner. And we ended up kind of easing off of that a little bit because we just found that people were kind of running out of stuff to do and we had made all of this content, but then we had structured it in a way that made it look like there was not very much content. So we sort of eased off of the, uh, you're meant to play this once for every partner and made it just sort of more of a choice. And like, you know, I think it sustains multiple playthroughs still, uh, but the differences are not as intensive as they were intended to be when we made the decision that like, now you can you take one horse, take one partner and that's it. There's a, there's a lot of different writing if you choose a different class and a lot of different writing if you choose a different partner, especially um, the sort of like hidden partner, I think changes a tremendous amount about the game. The so hidden I feel partner. Like, say again? Hidden partner. Which one well, there's, so there's three that are sort of more obvious and then a, a fourth partner that, I don't, I, mean, I don't want to spoil it, but there's a fourth potential partner that's, um, that's you're not meant to discover on your first playthrough. Oh, interesting. Okay. Now I'm trying to think, like I'm thinking back to Loathing, like I know of the three instantly. Yeah. Uh, and I'm trying to think, did I get a fourth one or not? Like, <laughs> Most people don't and it's, it, and that's sort of by design. It's, you're supposed to only realize the possibility later. Uh, that's cool. Yeah, because I, you know, I was wondering about the horse too, because I, I got all, all the horses and like, which one do you want to take? And I'm like, oh, okay. And I, I was kind of hoping that that would play into effect someplace because I picked the ghost horse. Sure. Oh my god! I, I'm going to get some reactions out of the ghost horse, and I didn't get any. Like the ghost horse would always just sit there, you know, at any place I went. And I'm like, you know, no one's noticing I'm riding a ghost horse. Like, is this just normal? <laughs> the the horses determine a lot about the random encounters that you get while you're traveling. Oh, so okay. you run into a lot more ghosts and skeletons than you would have if you had been using a different horse. Um, oh. the, the dark horse lets you uh, escape from any random encounter combat without getting the without it counting as a loss. Um, those are, those are the two biggest effects that those things have. The, the the crazy horse we sort of didn't quite have the time that we wanted to fully play out what uh, what that guy was capable of, but he he unlocks like sort of weirder locations. 
early. Yeah, I, yeah, I got a number of weird locations. That's actually the horse I picked. It was just because like the goofy eyes, and <laughs> it was the one village in the game that I visited with the crazy horse. And I was like, oh, my horse is getting up and drinking and dancing around, but no, it was a different <laughs> horse. <laughs> Yeah, and you know what? That's something that's interesting because if you look at like the world map at first, it's like, oh, this this game looks barren. Like there's nothing there. And as you slowly fill up, you start realizing there's so many locations. And even when I thought I was done with like the right side of the map, suddenly a new location. I'm like, wow, you crammed another one in here. Like I didn't think that was possible. Uh, and honestly, I loved that. And I felt like at the end, like the last, the third area, like the whole bottom part, like there was like nothing for me to find. I kept like searching and searching. I'm like, there's got to be more here. There's got to be more here. And finally I'm like, well, I guess I'll go do the, go find the train. And suddenly I was over. I was like, wait, well, I want more, you know, like I, I want more of this game, you know, I want to see what's down there, you know? So, and that's, that's very good. You know, the, the fact that people want more, um, did you want to do more or was it like, all right, this is where we got to end at this point. Well, so I think the, the the pacing of the end, what we had is kind of intended for uh, it to be rare or weird that you would finish the game by actually giving Norton a crown as opposed to playing out the like sort of ending train sequence. So that ended up being a little bit abrupt just because we kind of accidentally made it easy to... to for some people, I still think probably about half do the, do the train sequence. Yeah, I, I did the train sequence. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's I, still... It's still pretty abrupt, um, you know, and that's and that's a thing that we just like, you know, the game shipped with plenty of content, but because of the way that time works and and ran out, we just ended up with way more density in the early areas and then a little less density in the middle areas and then a little less in the in the western part. And so it just kind of it just kind of worked out that way. The the whole southwestern quadrant, if if you notice the map, it's labeled as the desolate lonesome coast, which is where future potential DLC will go. Yeah. Yeah, I did notice that and I was like, oh, you know, I'd like to see what's down there because I, I noticed like names didn't deter. Like it could be the worst sounding name thing ever. And you're still going. There's still a location like it doesn't. Like, well, I, I'm, also, I'm also looking forward to finding out what's down there. It's All like, right. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, one thing is, is the locations you go to. I noticed that there's not a lot of repeat. You know, the, other than like the, the fort, fortifications where, you know, you can climb up and see new areas, there really wasn't a lot. And even those were unique. They had like the tabletop game in the one and and it was just so varied. Like the graveyard where you had to find out the, the aunt or the, the, the cousin or something, her favorite cousin, you know, and like there's all these things. It's just, it's crazy. Like the cows, bad cows running around. And, you know, my partner hated the cows. So she leveled up every time, uh, you know, we killed some cows. And that's one thing I did want to ask the partner leveling up system is unique per part, you know, party member you have, but I didn't notice a, a scale. So I, I'm a grinder in RPGs. So I, when I found an area where I, Oh, there's like unlimited cows here, I'm just going to start powering up my partner. And I wound up doing it for like an extra hour and a half. And she never <laughs> leveled after a while. I'm like, why is she not leveling? Like, and I, I didn't realize she was at the end, but I just kept going and going and going. And I'm like, you know, like, did you, any idea why you didn't put a counter in there just, just I, to prevent I, people from doing what I did? <laughs> that that system went in pretty late. And so it was probably too late in the process to get like real UI attached to it. <clears throat> Pardon me, frog in my throat. Um, I probably should have, because I think it tells you what rank the partner is. It, well, it tells you what rank your partner is if you have nerd mode turned on. Cause that's yeah, I didn't have nerd mode on. System details in combat. I'm. I probably should have just replaced rank five with rank max or something. Just that's a, that seems like a video game thing to do. To just. Yeah. I mean, you do stop getting the messages about. I th I think unless nope. I do something. Up, oh, she still said it. Still said she, she still said she get carved uh, another thing in her uh, notebook, and I'm like, oh, keep going, keep going. I should, keep going. I, should, I should just fix that actually. I was gonna say I I picked the Pete partner and. I only really noticed him leveling up like on the random scenes, like when I was just traveling around the thing, it's just like, oh, Pete did this, he leveled up. And I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's how he works. The the Alice, Alice, you level up by killing skeletons, uh, or really just any undead. Uh, Susie, you level up by killing cows. The hidden partner, you level up with an item that you can find uh, various places out in the world. And, and yeah, Pete, it just kind of happened. Because Pete was also, like if you don't do anything in the prologue, you only have the option to take Pete as the partner. So we thought of him as kind of the default. 
Um, and so we also thought, well, if you're the kind of person that's not really poking around, maybe we should just level up your partner without you having to do anything. And so that's why he levels up that way. Ah, interesting. Yeah, I didn't realize it was the default that when I got to the partner select screen, I was thinking I was trying to select a different one, but I guess I hit the confirm button by mistake and it was just like, okay, we're taking Pete. And like, ah, I actually wanted someone else. But, but he turned out pretty useful overall though. So he very good at doing damage. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we intended for him to be the sort of powerful, easy to use combat guy too. So. Yeah, I was I was really surprised too with the combat. It's it's very deep. You know, you have different items you can use and different abilities and skills, and it it flowed really well. Um, I I enjoyed it. I know, Greg, you said you had a little bit of a, an issue with one thing in the combat, though. It was more like with the controls, because a lot of the turn-based games, like you obviously select your action and then you select your target. But since you guys are using both of the um, sticks or whatever to pick the target and pick the item at the same time i think sometimes my hand got off and it would change to a different target or i would somehow throw a stick of dynamite instead of just attacking it was just kind of like a weird twitch thing like that that i, I had noticed it wasn't overwhelming cumbersome i didn't like die a lot or anything because of that but it was just something that seemed kind of somewhat inconvenient but yeah, we could have used, I mean, it was kind of like we said, but by, by the time we really got the ball rolling on the switch port, we, we, and like, I think this is always true, but we could have used some more time to just play test. Like we should have bought more dev units so that more of us could play test the game at the same time. We ended up with a lot of logistical things where it's like, well, only one of us can really be playing this to see if there's anything annoying about the controller support at a time because we only had one, uh, we only had one switch dev kit to pass around between us. That was uh, actually something that I wish too, is that there was some easy way to get more external playtesting. Because we had, there's not a ton of combat in our demo. So even if we showed the demo at um, the at conventions or whatever, we wouldn't really get a, a sense of what, what people were doing in combats, especially the late game combats where you have a bunch of items and skills and like how that, how you interact with that. Um, and with the, Putting the game out on PC, it was very easy to just send somebody a code and say, here's the game, play it, let us know what you think. But with the, with Switch development, you can't do that um, there's, because it's the game only runs on special development units until it's live on the on the store, basically. Um, and so there isn't there isn't a really good way at this point to get some good, reliable play tests with a bunch of different people, um, which would be great if that were possible. I mean, arguably, releasing the game for sale is a way of doing that. Well, it's just not sure. a way of doing it. But th that puts you at risk of, of of running afoul of people not liking your game and panning you for it, and then less people are going to play your game because the reviews are all bad or whatever, right? Like, <clears throat> you want to address those issues before you release if you can. You know? Yeah, I mean, we were relatively confident that there weren't like significant issues, but yeah, like like Kevin said, I mean, it, if combat feels a little clumsy on your first three fights which is all we ever saw, right? From like handing people the switch and watching them play it. Uh, you're going to attribute that to you just not being familiar with it as opposed to like, ah, maybe we need to like tighten up the, the ranges for what counts as moving in a direction kind of thing. Yeah. Once I got that all straight and forward, it was, I mean, I occasionally made a mistake towards like the end of the game where I was throwing dynamite when I was like, <laughs> the enemy need to be killed with an attack or something, but it was nothing like groundbreakingly awful experience. I mean, I had more than enough, like, dynamite to spare too so i really I think my response was to just switch to using the d-pad for that instead of the joystick but that is what because i am an old mm. that is often what i will do with video games <laughs> <laughs> yes i always definitely prefer the d-pad when possible but unfortunately the joy-con does not have a d-pad on it i know there's the little buttons on it but it, yeah sometimes like just picking the different targets was yeah. kind of interesting too with the right joint with the right stick right. Yeah, I, I used the Joy-Con too. I, I played this all handheld, and I had no problem. I used like like you, uh, Zach. I go for the uh, Z-pad. Um, again, old school, so it worked fine for me. I, I had no problems. Uh, so it's interesting, you know. Not everybody's gonna have that same test, but yeah, it was, I was playing it with a pro controller on a TV for the most part. So it's it's weird I, to have so many use cases to test for. Wait, there was something we were playing the other day. There, and there were there, like four of us were talking about this game on the podcast and two of us liked it and two of us didn't like it for the same reasons. And it turned out that the two of us who didn't like it were the ones playing it in handheld mode and the two of us who did were the one playing it on a TV. Yuko's Island Express. Yeah. 
Oh, the, map, okay. the map is much harder to see on handheld than it is on a TV. So you just don't have a sense of where you are and what, where, how to get from place to place, I think. Yeah. So, but it's, it's, I mean, it's great that the Switch uh, allows all of these different ways into it, but then it's also challenging because you, the software has to support all of the approaches that the hardware can take. So it's, uh, man, it's a good piece of hardware, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. I love it. <laughs> it. It's it's definitely interesting to hear because there are certain games that you know don't play well on handheld or and play well on TV and vice versa, and uh, like this is this is one that you know I found very comfortable. You know I was able to play it just in bed, just relaxed. It was you know fun atmosphere. Uh, delayed me the getting text, up a couple. The text mornings. was nice and legible, and everything. The UI felt yes. big enough. And stuff. Yeah, right. I yeah. was able. I was no problem whatsoever with it. I thought it was really well done. Uh, in fact, that was like I said. I, I showed my wife the Splatoon scenes, and I just literally like, here, look at this, and and she was able to just turn around and read it uh, without saying, "Hold on, give it to me," like this, you know. Right. So, I thought it was done. There was, yeah, there was one little point in the plot. There was like a side quest. You have to like you go into like a dream sequence, and then like I totally didn't pay attention to some of the numbers that you needed to help the three ghosts or something to set like the pressure and stuff like. It would have been nice to have like a way to like revisit some of that information. You, you absolutely can. If you go outside and go all the way to the right, there's a diary, and you can you can read it and you could see everything again. Yeah, that was we, initially uh, we had made it so you could you had to be paying attention the first time because we were like at, you know let's be jerks about this. Um, but then like literally everyone who played the game complained about that, so we added the thing so you can go see it again. But still, a lot of people don't find it. It's it's, uh, it's not te telegraphed very well. That that yeah, is it's not telegraphed, telegraphed. right? Because it was yeah. it was like obviously tacked on. It's like uh, I'll just make this room wider and add some graves. Uh, but there's nothing <laughs> yeah. that really, like indicates any flow in that direction. So you you uh, you don't necessarily. See. Yeah, I had a problem there too because I I did them and I'm like I should be done. I should do all three, and uh, I'm like well. I how do I revisit? So I went exploring and I found it and I was like, Oh, I was off by a number. Like I forgot, like it was like nine, one, two or something. And I, I had nine, two, two and I completely messed it up. So I went back and changed it and I got it right. Um, but yeah, it, 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 I found it okay. Just a little exploration, but I did, I also was kind of like, I like, by the time I realized there was numbers in that sequence to probably pay attention to, I was already done with the first part. Right. And I was like, Oh man, I, I probably should be paying more attention to, to memorizing these numbers. And that one is that one's weird too. It it what I intended with all of those bandit encounters was that the sort of default means of dealing with those is that you would just fight them and that the non-combat means would be an optional side thing that was harder, but like no one treated any of them like that. Like the the puzzles were just so foregrounded in there that it kind of didn't like it didn't it didn't fulfill the mechanical intention that I had and so we, they were all designed with that initial intent in mind and then tweaked once we sort of like once they revealed to us what they actually were and so they're some of those things are slightly different than they would be if I had been going in there with a like assuming that basically everyone was going to want to solve the puzzle rather than just fight the monsters um and you know just should have known we'll know better next time <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say that one ghost town sequence with the ghost pencil that that was so phenomenal i loved like having to go between all the different departments <laughs> like please file this form here like oh you have to go over here to get the envelope and then oh you have to go like, back over here to get like a stamp it's like what the heck? yeah that's pretty good we, that we, also we, like the yeah, was 100 percent riff yeah. <laughs> that whole sequence yeah so. Now, so you, you you can't even give him a little bit of credit. He's like, nope, that was riff. Like, yeah. don't don't even look, don't even look Zach's way. That was riff. <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, riff. I think likes to sort of create these sort of quasi antagonistic relationships with the player when when possible. Um, and so he he, I think he enjoys the sort of quasi trolling that is Ghostwood. Uh, because there's definitely a bunch of people who just like are having none of it and stop as soon as they realize what's going on and they just leave. So, yeah, well, that's that's one thing I noticed. Like with the mayor's list of things, you only have to do like five of them. You don't have to do all seven. 
And I was like, oh, that's probably because of like Ghostwood and, and all that, <laughs> the trolling. But I'm like, no, I'm doing all seven. Like, no, I'm going to go through this little. And it really reminded me of Zelda in a sense with the whole trading sequences, like in A Link to the Past and, and Link's Awakening. Oh, you want this? Well, give me this. You want this? Give me this. And that's really what it was like. And I thought it was great. I was like hilarious. Like, oh, I'm done now, especially when you think you're done. Like, oh, no, no, you got to keep going. You got to go to this town all the way across the map. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, that five out of seven thing was on purpose to just sort of let people avoid whatever kind of stuff they didn't want to do. You know, some of some of them were just gimmies. Um, some of them were fairly easy but required fighting to 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 finish. And so if you were trying to but like it was it became increasingly more important to us over over development to make more or less everything in the game possible to do without ever getting into combat. Um and that was just a way of like, well, we can make one of these require a fight. Um, and then yeah, you like don't that. have to do it. You can still complete the sequence without doing all seven. I also like the fact that even though they're stick figures, you you, you guys created, I don't know if this is Riff or if this is you, Zach, um, created so many unique characters like Cactus Bill and like his family and like, you know, having the little babies and all that. I'm like, wow, that, that's so weird, but it's so funny. And like out of stick figures, I would never expect to walk up to a guy dressed as a cactus and find, later on find a woman who's obsessed with cactus. I don't even know how they produce children. I don't want to know, but the fact that it exists is hilarious. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, stick figures are more powerful than 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 people think. There's a, there's a book called Understanding Comics uh, written by a guy named Scott McLeod. And he's got there's a there's a just one particular page in it that really illustrates this. It just shows you a bunch of different human faces drawn at varying levels of detail, and it sort of talks about how, up to a certain point, the more you abstract a representation of a face, the more sort of emotional character the reader can bring to it. It's it's just sort of like you know something is described in text. You have to imagine what it looks like, and if something is drawn in a way that all you can make out is like basic facial emotions, then you sort of have to bring more of the characterization to it from your imagination. And I think we really benefit from that. And also the fact that nobody expects, nobody, like you look at this game and you don't expect there to be good writing and you don't expect there to be good characters and you don't expect there to be good gameplay. And so really we can be kind of half ass at all of those things and it's still impressive because it's exceeding your low expectations. That's that's an interesting way of putting it, setting the bar low and, and reaching highs. <laughs> I mean, I'm not really much on, like, has to have the top-notch level graphics. I mean, I was perfectly fine with the black and white simple colors and then all just stick figures and everything. As long as everything, like, the gameplay is solid, that's usually what gets me most. So that became really addictive hook there because you're, like, you're searching around all these different places, finding hidden items, battling random monsters. I mean, that's I always love all that kind of stuff. So it was cool to see the discovery and all the expert writing behind it. I mean, that was so great. That's yeah. good. You know, we really we delivered the kind of thing that I like, at least, and that's, you know, you, you don't always pull that off. Like, some, sometimes uh, Sometimes you, you you push and push and push, and the, the baby that comes out is still terrible. And uh, <laughs> got, like, <laughs> that is awesome, right there. That, that's my quote of the day. I'm using that. <laughs> wow. And on that note, <laughs> you know, uh, this is something you know that I was expecting to see in the game, and and I didn't obviously, but. I'm, you know, it'd be really neat to see this maybe in the DLC is I was, I was actually expecting to go to an area where it'd be nothing but like an outhouse or something. And like you open it up and there is, you know, a guy reading a script with a microphone and that's the narrator to have been talking to you this whole game. <laughs> and like suddenly, Oh crap, you found me like, uh, and he like shuts the door and just cause he's, he's there. He's such a, he's such a funny character and you never see him. And I was like, Oh, that'd be so cool if you just walked into him, like so meta, like, Oh, here I am narrating your adventure and from an outhouse or something. And I might, that might ding us into M for mature territory on the ESRB. <laughs> well, you know, it could be at a bar, but, you know, it's, you, don't to, you don't have to see the guy going to the bathroom. It's just an outhouse with a little, like, moon door, you know. The narrator, the narrator is basically just me and Riff talking to the player in a, in a voice that we've developed over 15 years. So, yeah, putting him in a bar. That makes sense. There you go. Because so, yeah, I was expecting, the, the game is so meta that I was expecting to kind of run into that. Yeah, we, you know, we try to be fairly sparing with fourth wall breaking in a, in a, 
a real like on the nose way, I think. Um, I, I think I think that this is available for free, uh, but I did a GDC talk about our approach to uh, comedy in games. And it, Riff and I sat down and talked about it for me to make the sort of outline of the presentation. And we had never really thought about the specific structure of the, of the ways that we approached things before. And it was like, I learned a lot about his process from just sitting down for an hour working out like, oh, what, what, how do we imagine the narrator? Like what, and like, are there differences between the way that I think of it and the way that Riff does? And we, and you know, it turned out to like, you know, obviously we can't produce stuff in the same style for so many years without more or less being on the same page about how that stuff works. But it was still, it was, it was fun to talk about and fun to put that talk together. And I think it turned out pretty well. Um, it just kind of talks about like, we like being able to break the fourth wall. Like there's, is a, there is a hard mode that you can unlock during the prologue that just makes all the fights much, much harder. Um, and we're able to just like, we've established enough of a relationship with the player that we can just say in, in the context of the fiction, this is going to make the game a lot harder. Are you sure you want to do this thing? And then at the end, like when it's time for you to watch the ending cutscene, we can straight up say, this is not going to change anything about your character or the world. This is just what the ending would be like if you watched it now. So feel free to do this. And then you'll appear right back outside the theater when it's over and nothing will have happened. And like, I, I wish games would tell me that, right? Like I wish I, I wish that a fallout game or an elder scrolls game would let me know at the moment where, all right, you're about to start the ending sequence and whatever you do, this is going to be the last time you can save. Right. And so I felt like, Having a, having a relationship between the narrator and the player where we're able to just be a little meta about it also helps us provide an actual better video game experience in some ways. And that's, it's, an, it's an advantage of our sort of style that I, we weren't anticipating, but that turned out to be really valuable, I think. I agree with you. Uh, I think uh, having that notification at the point of no return uh, is very important, especially if it's like, oh, I missed that. Well, I'm already too late. Uh, like in Mass Effect 2, if you if you played that, you know, going on the suicide mission, it's like, all right, going through this relay is going to set up the end sequence of the game. Like, are you sure you want to do it kind of deal? Like, you know. Um, and I think that's important to the player so they don't feel like they've missed out on anything. Um, so now, what you for a Mass Effect fan. Yeah, yeah. I, I, like, I like storytelling. That's why. I like role playing. I like storytelling. I like, uh, you know, and th this, the narrative, like I said, in this is just is fantastic, the, the writing and all that. Um, now you did mention GDC. Um, what other shows have you done and brought this to, and how was the reception? Uh, Kevin probably remembers better than I do. We went to I think three different PAXs, four different PAXs. Um, PAX Prime or West, I guess, uh, a couple times. PAX East and uh, PAX Australia. Uh, we went to South by Southwest. We went to Indiecade. We went to. Um, a couple of smaller events in different cities. Um, so, you know, we tried to get a, a variety of places around the U.S. Uh, and, and Australia, I guess, um, to show off the game and 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 uh, get feedback. Um, but it was a lot of a lot of the West Coast. Um, yeah, because that's where where we're kind of primarily based. So. Yeah, because the reason I one of the reasons I ask is I have a good good friend of mine who uh, I do industry talks with. Uh, uh, named Dan Butchko, and uh, we actually just filmed one, and I let him know that I was talking with you guys, and he he puts on a show called Play NYC. Uh, he's the CEO of Playcrafting, and he told me he's like I've been trying to get in touch with them. I'd love to to have them there. That West of Loathing would be a great fit for this show, and I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll I'll, I'll pitch it to them. I'll let them know. Um, uh, so here I am doing that. Uh, you know, I know he's been trying to reach out to you, um, but I know he wants you know, you guys to be there. And I think, I think the show would be great for you to get some extra hands on. Um, there's a lot of people, you know, like you said, a lot of things are West coast and there's not a lot on the East coast, but there's a lot of people over here and uh, a lot of, a lot of new audiences. So I don't know if that's something that, that interests you or not, if you would be interested in coming out to the East coast. I think we will probably wait until our next game to do that. Um, just because we, West of Living has been out for about a year uh, on PC and like the past couple of shows we've gone to have not been um, nearly as, as useful for us because like we don't derive nearly as much benefit at this point from watching people play the game um, in terms of like playtesting sense. And uh, I don't know how much 
uh, benefit there is. Like when the, when a game is already out, it's less exciting to play it at a show, and so I think way more people are willing to just sort of pass up a thing that they know isn't sort of exclusive to this experience that they could just go home and play if they wanted to. Um, and so we just get less less sort of enthusiastic of a response when it's something that's already sort of out, out and available. Um, and, and in spite of that, it is still just as exhausting as a show yeah. where we we reach huge new audiences and 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 it's really good for us in 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 sort of like business terms. Like we we will go and then it's just standing on a concrete floor, you know, keeping track of where all the iPads are so nobody runs off with them <laughs> for four days or whatever. It just it just wipes us out for. Yeah. A while afterwards, and so it's and it's away from working on DLC or ports or whatever. Like it's yeah. it's such a balancing act in terms of people want people have wanted DLC for a while, but we've just because we have to put so much effort into porting things and supporting the game, and also Kingdom of Loathing. Like we still have this this game that's been in existence for 15 years that we're still adding content to, um, and we have you know thousands of players so still coming in checking it out every day. Um, that like balancing our time is very tricky. So now you didn't being a small lifestyle company is that we are necessarily spread kind of thin, right? Like we don't want to grow to the point where none of us are having fun anymore because we suddenly work for a big company, you know, which like we wouldn't be here if that was what we wanted out of our lives. Uh, but the more, I mean, in a way, having a lot of post-launch support is a good problem to have because it means a lot of people bought the game. So, uh, right. and it, the game has been, the game launched, our, like our programmer, Victor, is an incredibly talented and, and conscientious guy. And so we did not end up with a ton of technical problems, right? But there is still just like, there is just all of this stuff that you don't think of. Like you spend the entire time that you're finishing up the project thinking, oh, I can't wait till this game comes out and we can finally relax. And then it comes out and it's like, ah, crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can, I can see that being uh, an issue. Now you did mention uh, next game. Uh, is, is the new game already in the works? Are you working on DLC for West of Loathing first or like, what are we looking a little, at? A little bit of both. Um, there's there's a, a good chunk, uh, a good sized chunk of DLC for West of Loathing that we're, that we're in the, the Maybe not the home stretch, but we're we're coming up on third, let's say. Uh, and the the next game is is still sort of in the in the in the like early design and and very very pre production phases to the point where no one no one has seen any of the documentation except me yet. Um, <laughs> so that's that's how you can tell it's early days with that. But um, we're hoping that it won't take as long to make a next game as it did to take West of Loathing, because with West of Loathing, we were really building the engine the entire time. And the engine is, like I said, because of the immense talent of our programmer, extremely flexible and sort of game agnostic. So we could just make another game without having to do anything to the engine to speak of and just crank out content. Um, but the fact that, you know, the fact that, West of Loathing has been successful enough for us to keep the whole team together means that we'll be able to add more features for just extra cool stuff that we want. But still, I'm hoping, I'm hoping for, I don't know, like an 18 month cycle instead of a two year cycle on that. Um, no, that might be no, too optimistic. Do you do you expect this to also come to the Switch as well as like PC oh. and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah. The West of Loathing has done well enough on the Switch, and I think we don't have to like get permission to release another game on there now, do we? Like, we, we just we just can create a new title now that we're sort of in the system. Yeah. Same with Steam too. There's going to be so much stuff that's easier about the second game now that we actually have. Because I mean, we've been nominally in the games industry since 2003, but we didn't know how anything worked as far <laughs> as like a normal video game. <laughs> goes right because we just like oh my game is just a web page on this server that i that i bought and put in this data center in phoenix uh how to steam um, <laughs> but, but now we know um so you know it's uh yeah i'm 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 optimistic about our future any any chance of i know like west of loathing came out uh, earlier on steam and then eventually to the switch uh and you you do obviously you do have a kingdom of loathing which you're, you're still maintaining there's another game you put out word realms yeah. um any any chance of these making their way to the switch no <laughs> short realms, answer no <laughs> it was uh it was developed in flash uh and the idea of going back to that and porting that to a, a 
a situation that would actually work on a modern console is a little scary. Yeah, um, and it didn't. It did not do very well, like um, commercially. Um, and we have gotten a tremendous amount of feedback that that people really dislike the art. So if we were going to redo it, we probably want to just redo all the art, and that is a huge, huge task. Um, Maybe maybe someday we'll do something similar to that again uh, if we if we run out of ideas, but not money. Um. <laughs> there, is a, there is a game that is sort of a stripped down version of that that doesn't have quite the same um, like RPG, RPG depth. Yeah, yeah. It's it's called Master Swords, and it's available on iOS. Uh, we did that as a contract job for an educational software company, so it's it's very much targeted at kids. Um, so it's very easy also compared to, to Word Realms. If you, if you like that kind of gameplay, you can get that game now on iOS. Um, yeah. I, don't, I don't even, I don't know exactly who owns it anymore. So the odds of that coming to Switch are also extremely low and completely out of our hands at this point. Because um, that was just work for hire uh, yeah. that we did. But it's, um, I don't know, it's fun. You know, if you, if, you, if, you, if you do like Word Realms, you'll like Master Swords probably. There is a there's a game on the Switch now that is very much like those two games uh, by another studio. It's I want to say like Letter Press Adventures or something of that that ilk. I don't remember the name specifically. I haven't played it, but a friend of ours was saying was playing that and, and was bemoaning the fact that we had not been able to bring uh, Word Realms over to Switch. So um, yeah, maybe if you guys have the time, but but uh, you know, and, and the money, you know, and you're bored one day and say, hey, let's do this for for shits and giggles, you know. <laughs> yeah, a friend of ours suggested that we take all the profits from uh, West of Loathing and just funnel them into like a an HD remake of. Yeah, of just Word really Realms. down on Word Realms. I really try to make it work. Yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, I would like to see a sequel even to you know to West of Loathing. I mean, obviously the DLC, but I'd really like to, you know, like. A lot of people don't have time for an MMO, uh, which right. is unfortunate. But the loathing world is so fantastic. Like you guys have created this very funny, very unique world where you know the undead are running around and horses have crazy eyes and there's mad cows and like all this is normal to people. And and I'd love to see more. Any chance that there will be a West of Loathing two or something else of Loathing? It, oh, uh, definitely something else of loathing. Like we, our our plan all along with this was to build an engine that we could make games in for another ten years. Um, you know, as long as I I am confident in saying that I would be happy making games of this style with sort of you know minor enhancements and and refinements and new content and new settings for as long as people are interested in buying and playing them. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Like if if you like this. Keep an eye out because there'll be more. That's awesome. It's awesome to hear. <laughs> is the DLC going to be free or is it like uh, going to be a tech on extra cost? It's going to be or... a tech on paid. Okay. Show. We haven't we haven't okay. really uh, arrived at a final plan for 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 pricing or anything. And it's it's kind of an experiment too. You know, we we got to figure. Okay. Out. Yeah, I I just wanted to check because. I really liked it. I just didn't know like how expansive this was going to be, or if it just gonna be like okay, we'll just do the little lone part in the desert and just a couple more locations and quests or whatever. So, you know, you know, it, 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 because we are selling it, we are being cognizant of how much content there needs to be yeah. in it to sell, and so yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry too much about that. And plus, I think we've we've bought a certain amount of goodwill by providing so much. For eleven dollars, right? Yeah, yeah there, there really is a lot there. I'm not saying that, that there's not. I was just kind of trying to see if there's how big of an ex DLC expansion you were planning. I mean, obviously, if it's just as big as the game, then yes, it warrants a nice price tag. But if it's just going to be a couple minor add-ons and bug fixes, then perhaps it'll be somewhere in between. Somewhere in between those two, and at a fairly low price point is is what I expect. Yeah, it'll, it'll launch at. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I can't wait to see more in this world of loathing. Uh, Greg, do you have any final questions you want to ask? I don't think so. I mean, this game was just so enjoyable. I really did like it a lot. Um, Thanks. Yeah, I have to look out and do another playthrough to see how much is different, because I know my initial route, I did like the somewhat honorable thing, and I got to see a lot of those side things to skip certain things. So that was really cool to right. see. Yeah, pick yeah, it up from class, pick it up from partner, and yeah, you yeah. Think you'll be pleasantly surprised how much stuff is different. 
Yeah, I was ruthless. I started reading from all like the necro books and like all that stuff. And the narrator's like, "Are you sure that's gonna summon the devil?" I'm like, "Yeah, let's do it." You know. <laughs> yeah, so different, different, definitely different uh, play play style, and, and I it's like good. that. He doesn't care about that, but if you have Alice as your partner while you're doing that, she gets real salty about it. I had Susie with as my partner, so she didn't care. She's like, "Whatever." Um, but yeah, so if you guys are interested in this game, which you totally should be, you like funny games, you like RPGs, you like comical humor, like this is just a great, great game. Bang for your buck, eleven dollars. You can get it right now. It's available on the eShop. Um, Kevin, Zach, both of you, thank you so much for joining us today. It was, it's been an honor and a pleasure. Well, thanks for having us. It's been a lot of fun. And uh, if you guys you know, want to check out their game, please do. Um, Asymmetric Publications, uh, follow them because their next game, I, I can't wait. It's going to be something spectacular if West of Loathing is anything to go by. And if you want more Nintendo news, please go to nintendofuse.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. We've got more videos like this, podcasts, game chats, a bunch of new content. And uh, thank you so much for watching and have a great day.